the synthetic counterfeits, synthetic and counterfeit opioids we're hearing more and more about. The media is talking a lot about them. We're seeing them more in law enforcement and DEA dinner interdictions. These are substances that are made essentially um, in kind of clandestine labs and basements and people's homes and storage units, and they're making fentanyl, which is a very potent opiate. If, if we're treating someone with fentanyl in the ER, we use micrograms, not milligrams. This is way stronger. And the things that's so worrisome about this is, you don't know, they, there's not a lot of quality control in this kind of arena. You don't know how strong this is. You don't know if you're a person who acquires that. You legitimately don't know if it's a 1% strength or 100% strength. It's what we unfortunately lost those kiddos in Park City to. It's what law enforcement worries about when they go into a home. Like, what if I happen to get one of these really potents up into my nose or onto my skin? These are, as well, in the same family. We're thinking about all the same substances. And I truly don't worry about one more than the other. A, a kid from West High called me after the, the Park City events and said, so what's the most dangerous way to take one of these meds or one of these substances? I said, well, you put it in your body. I said, well, no, it's gotta be injecting it, right? And I said, no, it's you put it in your body. Like, you eat it, you smoke it, you inject it, you snort it. It, it, it's dangerous, period. Don't think that there's a safe version. They're all very risky, regardless of the methods. So how do we get here with these? There's a kind of a three-fold problem that are three ways I like to look at it. First of all, there's the prescription angle. We are writing 7,000 opioid prescriptions in Utah every day. 7,000, think about that. Healthcare providers across the US in 2015 wrote 300 million prescriptions for pain medications, $24 billion worth. That's enough for every American adult to have a bottle. It's about the same in Utah. We figured it out, it was around what, 2.5 million pills and we got 2.9 million Utahns. So pretty much a prescription bottle for every Utah. 1.9 million. So it ultimately came down to the amount of prescriptions that we're writing means that at any given point, more than 87% of the population include, that's every single person in Utah, that's how many pills we're writing, so they would all have a prescription um, for, for one of these painkillers yeah. in the state of Utah, 87% of people. One in 25 adults are receiving treatment for chronic pain with opiate pain relievers. Two million ad adults are addicted to their opiate pain relievers. And each day in the US, 152 people die from an overdose, 54 plus from their prescription medications alone. And I wanna be careful here because I really don't want it to seem that what I'm saying is I want people to suffer and get rid of this because that's not the reality. There are uses for these substances. But as we have unfortunately had industry um, that has sold it to us that you need a pill for everything. And we had hospital regulations and JCO requirements that said we had to treat pain as a fifth vital sign. Opiates became a lot more prescribed and a lot more prevalent than they have been in the past. And again, I'm not saying get rid of them, I want people to suffer, I just, we have to be accountable and aware of this. So I'll give you an idea of how opioid prescribing and sales, this is 1999 to 2010, that dark green is opioid sales. And that's in kilograms. As these prescription painkiller sales have gone up, deaths have gone up right with them. So we got that element we gotta think about. The second is heroin. The CDC reported in 2015 that between 2002 and 2013, the rate of heroin-related overdose deaths nearly quadrupled. Again, we're losing more people to heroin alone than to HIV AIDS. On that left, there's a graphic that shows you heroin use has increased among most demographic groups. So this is all of us. This is, doesn't matter, again, your age, your gender, the color of your skin, whether you have resources, whether you have insurance. And I always get a little nervous when I show this because there are plenty of folks who will level the claim that the only reason we're doing this is because, or we're focusing on this, is because we're now losing white kids in the suburbs. Well, we lost our brother, a white kid in the suburb in 1996, in a neighborhood plenty of folks would be happy living in. This is not new, it's just gotten so huge that it's impossible now to ignore it. And as that use has gone up, the deaths have gone up. 300% increase in deaths. Uh, as you can see in that purple line. So what did the CDC say we should do in responding to the heroin epidemic? They're calling it an epidemic. Three things. One, prevent people from starting to use it. Two, reduce heroin addiction. And three, reverse overdoses. So the CDC is actually even recommending we start looking at getting naloxone out there. It isn't just, I always felt kind of edgy when I started this. People would go, what are you doing? No, it, the CDC is saying we should do it. it. It's really not edgy, it's responsible. And then finally, like I mentioned, those synthetic counterfeit opioids. If you want to freak yourself out a little bit, uh, pull up www.mrchemistry.com. Looks like a site your kid's going to learn about chemistry. 
I can pull it up at my kid's school. He's a 13-year-old, probably pretty close to your age, 13-year-old. I can't Google sexy girls at his school, but I can Google and get mrchemistry.com. That's a site where kids can go buy U47700 directly from China. There are number, numerous sites just like it. And we're going to continue to see more and more of these. Think about it, it, it just on a supply and demand American concept, right? More demand equals more supply. People will find a way to provide the supply. There are only limited places you can grow heroin poppies. You've got to have the right climate, right temperature, right altitude, right weather. You've got to have a good crop year. Some places in Mexico, some places in South America, Afghanistan, we've heard of the spots, right? So that means a limited supply. If you can make this stuff in your storage unit, in your lab, in your whatever, and people are buying it, it's not going away. That's just the reality. We're going to see more and more of this coming in as our demand continues. So here we are, kind of uh, brutal sounding. None of this has been all that uplifting, but so access to prescription opioid medications continue to be widespread. Heroin use and overdoses are increasing in Utah and the U.S. Counterfeit opioids are becoming more and more problematic. Overdose deaths are continuing to rise. Children and adolescents are impacted both directly and indirectly in my Pete's world. So what can we do? Well, you guessed it. I'm going to talk about the role for naloxone here. Knowing again that this is not a fix for the whole problem. This is just a way to keep people alive. And nobody can get better if they're dead. Bottom line. So naloxone rescue programs have existed since 1996, Chicago, New York, uh, uh, San, uh, San Antonio, uh, San Francisco. They've existed since 1996. We joined their ranks in 2015 with Utah Naloxone. I say this to Sam every time, but I think we need to make our logo a circle if we're going to fit in. <laughs> Which one does not belong, it looks like there. And these programs first legalized in 20, 2001. First one started in Chicago in 1996. They thought they were doing it legally, if you ask them. And they said, wait a minute, we have an, a, 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 an antidote for this? Hmm. Why don't we put it into people's hands? And they started giving it to people who were overdosing. They were tired of seeing people die. Now there's 47 states that have naloxone access yet laws. Utah was one of the first in the middle of the country to broach in there, passing their laws in 2014, and then again last year really refining and strengthening them in 16. Morbidity and Mortality Reports, MMWR, is a CDC publication that looked at these programs and said between 1996 and 2014, what did they do? Well, they put out over 150,000 rescue kits into communities, and they found that 26,000 of those were being used to reverse an overdose. One in six. That's not like most public health endeavors, right? We've all learned CPR. I've never used it outside of the ER. I'm glad we all know it because I want us to know what if we need it. but. Not many public health efforts, if you target it that well, can be that successful at saving a life. Now, it's important to note that doesn't mean the other five kits somebody didn't live. That just means that, that they weren't necessarily needed. Um, and, and, and I know this is in a lot of people's heads. Is this increasing use? Are you giving people a parachute? Are you giving people an excuse to think that they can use more, they can use riskier, they can use something they wouldn't have used before? And the reality is no. We were talking a little bit about it. You said you heard something about it. Nobody that's had naloxone or Narcan ever wants to get it again. They feel terrible if they're opiate dependent. They go immediately into withdrawals. You ask people, we ask people when we do a lot of street outreach, you know about this stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, if you were dying, would you want someone to give it to you? Well, and a legitimate pause. Nobody's saying, I'm going to use a little bit more and then just give me that stuff. It, it's just not the reality. There have also been studies, and it's a hard study to do, but there have been studies that show actually having naloxone and being reversed by someone whose job it was not to reverse you, your mom, your best friend, your spouse, a law enforcement officer, people who it's not their typical job to do this, it's something different happens there than when it's you and I, it's our job to do it. There's something different for these people, like you heard Mitch talk about that look on his mom's face begging him not to die. There's this kind of incentive that people describe. So what is naloxone? Well, it's a pure, non-addictive prescription medication that its only job is to block those opiates. You can't get high from it, you can't relieve pain from it, you can't uh, um, overdose on it, you can't become dependent upon it. We've used it in ERs and EMS rigs since 1971. This is not a new substance. It's not a controlled substance, so you don't have to you know, go through all the hoops you do for getting the opiates. It's, there's no effects, like I said in the video, no effects if somebody's not used opiates. So if someone has a heart attack and you give them naloxone, not going to hurt them. Not going to help them, but you're not going to hurt them. Any one of you went down right now, and I'll guarantee you, first thing EMS is going to do if, if the officers are saying, I don't get to you first, is give you naloxone. I'm going to give you naloxone and check a glucose, because those are the two things that can potentially really change an outcome right then. 
works quickly, one to three minutes if you get to someone in time, and it only lasts about 30 to 90 minutes. So a lot of these substances will last longer than naloxone, which is why it's really important to call 911. You don't wanna just reverse it and hope. You wanna get EMS or medical attention to decide when they're ready to go. Only works on opiates. Doesn't work on cocaine, alcohol, methamphetamine, benzos, which are nerve pills. Yeah. If you reverse it, and then the, the 30 to 90 minutes has gone past, mm -hmm. and the original drug is still there, can you give it again and it's still working? And we'll yep. Do it, right? And that's exactly what we do many times in the ER is you watch somebody and you say, oh boy, they're starting to nod off again or their oxygen levels are starting to go down again. And you just, you do. Sometimes you have to give multiple doses. In my kids' world, sometimes we have to put them on a continuous drip of it for hours until that substance breaks down in their body. So what is an opiate uh, overdose and what actually happens when you overdose? So this schematic kind of reminds me of a, a golf tee, but you have these receptors in your brain, and the opioids, like a puzzle piece, only fit in those opioid receptors. And when they go in there, they relieve pain, they provide the euphoria, that high sensation, but if you have too many of those filled, it causes respiratory depression. It slows down your breathing. You're not delivering oxygen. What does naloxone do? Well, naloxone has a much higher affinity, meaning it's stickier for those places. So if you get it in there in time, it'll kick off those other opiates, bind in that receptor, and you'll start breathing again. Pretty phenomenal, right? If you see a kid drowning in a pool, my bet, every single one of us in here is gonna jump in and grab that kid out of the pool before EMS ever gets there, before law enforcement ever gets there. If you're camping or hiking or hunting with your buddy and they fall in the river, you're not gonna say someone will get them down there, it's gonna work out okay. You're gonna pull them out of the river. That's exactly what naloxone does. It pulls them out of that river, it pulls them out of that pool, it gets the oxygen back into them, which is why it's so important that we have it in people's hands. Three minutes without oxygen can make an enormous difference in someone's outcome. It can make a difference between getting up and walking onto a gurney, potentially never getting up, having long-term brain damage, ending up in a facility, never being yourself again. That's why this is so important. That's why it's so important that law enforcement carries it. They're there many times before EMS is. Salt Lake, it's a six to 12 minute lapse. Washington County down by St. George, it's a 20 to 25 minute lapse sometimes law enforcement before EMS. Oxygen is, you know, time is brain. We say in medicine, goofy statement, but that's reality. Time is brain. So knowing we have all this, knowing there's these programs that have been successful, knowing lives can be saved, Utah jumped in and started passing legislation. 2014, the first laws went through. There was an overdose, uh, kind of a Good Samaritan law that encouraged people to call. And then there was the naloxone bill. This was uh, Representative, or sorry, Representative Spackman Moss and Senator Shiazawa's an ER doc, put the first law through. And it did a couple of really important things. A lot of words here, but they're kind of important words. I'll highlight the important ones. They said it's not unlawful or unprofessional. So anything in our jobs, right, two things we don't want to do, break the law, lose our license. So it's not unlawful or unprofessional conduct for health professionals to prescribe or dispense. So I can write you a script or I can give you a kit. And this next part's important to someone who's at risk of overdosing or at risk of witnessing an overdose. Because you can't save yourself from an overdose. Someone else has to be prepared. But that's weird. I don't write a prescription to Lana because she thinks Mike's got strep throat and we're going to treat him and make sure he's okay. That's just not how it works. But in this realm, it absolutely has to be that way. You have to get this substance to someone else who will be using it on another. There's no physician-patient relationship required, so I can, any prescriber can, write a prescription to someone that they don't have a record on. I can't write you a prescription for 800 milligram Motrins. You're not my patient, but I can write you naloxone. And that's set up for the entire state. It does require that you tell folks they gotta get medical attention, so they gotta go to an ER or they gotta go uh, call 911. And it clarifies that this is not a duty, this is voluntary. If you have naloxone and for whatever reason you don't use it, no one can come back to you and hold you liable for that. This is a voluntary decision to use it on someone. Well, we realized this was great, we got things rolling, and last year when we all kind of got together, and I, I loved that the representatives and senators said, this is not even a bipartisan issue, this is a nonpartisan issue. And they all jumped in and said, let's take some different angles of how we can make this more widespread and more available. And we realized, I can write prescriptions, and I can dispense, because I have those letters after my name, but all these other people, all of you, all the moms, all the Sams, all the people who are involved with folks who could be at risk, they can't technically dispense it. So a law went forward and said, we're gonna create this overdose outreach provider, people who can furnish naloxone. Now look at all the list of everyone here. So law enforcement, fire departments, Salt Lake City Fire is going to start leaving naloxone kits on the scene after they've reversed somebody with an overdose. 
EMS providers, people who work in the recovery community, people who work in the homeless community, folks who work in health departments. We thought this was pretty smart, that last line there. Individuals. So essentially anyone, any one of you can be providing naloxone to someone that you're worried about or someone that you have a suspicion or concern about. Representative Elison took the angle of saying, let's get a standing order, meaning you don't even need the prescription anymore. We recently got the health department to sign that, which says that you can walk into participating pharmacies and say, I'd like a naloxone kit. Or a pharmacist can say, you know what, I've realized that you're taking blank, 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 blank medicine, and I'd like you to have this just in case of an overdose for you or someone in your home. And Representative McKell took the step, as he mentioned, with the pilot program to say, let's actually get this out there to people. Let's not just make it legal. Let's actually start putting it into communities. And let's make it clear that as part of people's jobs, they're completely liability protected. So the law was good. We all, as humans of Utah, were covered with liability protections. But this made it clear that folks working in law enforcement, folks working in health department, all those organizations I mentioned were also liability protected. And $250,000 went out to start furnishing these kits to people across the state. What do these kits look like? Here's some different examples. We've got our little state fair um, set up of them. I won't spend too much time on them, but suffice it to say that there are two intranasal versions. Um, you can see uh, the kind of kitty corner. The Narcan nasal spray is one. If anybody uses Imitrex for migraines, it's the same kind of deal. Pull it out of the package, put it in the nose, and push the button. It's slick, it doesn't have needles, you don't have to worry about needle stick risks. Uh, yeah, pass it around. Um, those cost about $150 cash. My insurance, I Blue Cross Blue Shield, paid for it with a $31 copay. And there are public interest pricing so that law enforcement entities or health departments, organizations like us can buy it for $75 for a kit or two. There's another intranasal uh, form, which is what Spanish Fork Police Department, it sounds like uh, Utah County is going to use as well. It's a generic form where you have to take a couple pieces and parts apart. And it's a little bit more complicated. You take a yellow cap off, a yellow cap off, take a purple cap off, don't bite it because it's glass, don't drop it because it's glass, things that Sam and I have both always done, uh, not always, but both actually done. And you put the little spray on there. There's a little bit of a hold up on some of these because the little nose cone has been recalled. So you, some pharmacies may or may not have that. Well, it's important to, to note too that if you forget any one of those steps or if you drop the vial or uh, any of those things, it just becomes a naloxone squirt gun. So it's, you wasted a dose and they're, they're actually not cheap either. Yeah, those are about, when we last acquired, about forty two fifty a dose and then the cones were uh, $3 a piece, so around $95 to $100 for those. Um, my copay with Blue Cross Blue Shield was $24 on those. I've seen Medicaid and other insurance plans cover them. This device, I have a love-hate relationship because I love the concept. Um, looks like it could be in a Happy Meal, right? It talks to you and it tells you what to do. This trainer contains no needle or drug. The actual one tells you it's active. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. Great, right? Well, and I, I told a couple of you when we were talking about this earlier, any idea? So this has this generic medicine in it, which is the other injectable kits that Sam and I have here today and that we are what we give out. This dose is in here. This is $15 wholesale at Primary Children's. What do you guess a kit of two of these would run? $4,500. Yeah, there you go. We got $4,575 was the average wholesale price acquisition at Primary Children's last week when I had them pull it up. So, my insurance won't cover it. Uh, he's done some, done some research, or he's just a really good guesser, one of the two. Um, uh, my insurance won't cover it, Medicaid won't cover it. Um, it's a great product, I love the concept, I love the ease of use, that's just really difficult for me to swallow, that that's where they've gone with that. Um, that same dose is in these injectable vials. This is what's been used for 20 plus years in community programs, but it takes steps and it does take needles. So a needle, a single dose, you have to pull it up and you give it in an arm, a thigh, a butt. No Pulp Fiction, not in the heart. Anybody seen Pulp Fiction? Don't give it in the heart. That, that is a very wide held, unfortunate fallacy. Yeah. That, that one suggested putting it in the thigh. Yep, big muscle. But aren't we trying to get it to the brain? 
Good point. So when you give it in the nose, people have sometimes asked me, well, they're not breathing. How are you getting into them if they're not breathing? You want it across those blood vessels and it'll go right through the blood vessels into the brain. Similarly, a big muscle group, so a thigh, a shoulder, a bottom, butt, gluteus, they have good blood flow. So it will, all that blood will circle back up to the brain. So, you know, as your heart pumps, as opposed to a neck muscle. Sure, yeah, not a lot of blood flow in these muscles. They're skinny little muscles without great blood flow. The big, kind of the big meaty muscles are the muscles that you want. Uh, where can you get these kits? Um, the I forgot to, well. uh, oh, you know what? Veterans can actually get these at the VA or any of these forms at the VA for no this more than $9. Be reused for training purposes. Also, if you lose the cap, it will not stop talking to you. <laughs> Lessons learned. Uh, it will I'm keep going. For that. Yeah. So, so you can any veteran can get any of these for no more than nine dollars at the VA. I'm not certain. I'm hoping that the VA did not pay forty-five hundred dollars for these. And I think it's it's also important to acknowledge too that Utah, um, among being one of the worst in the nation, period, as far as veterans go, we are number one in the nation for overdose death rates. Um, I don't know why that is, but that um, it is. So it's important to acknowledge yeah. that it is available to them if not only from us or from other pharmacies, but if they go to VA pharmacies, they can absolutely get it for a very low cost. Mm -hmm.